What's up TLR? Thank you so much for joining us here on YouTube. If we have not met, my name is Peyton and we are in part three of Living the Dream, so thanks for joining us. We have a lot of exciting stuff going on. If you are a freshman, we want to send you a welcome home box. This is your last chance this week to sign up, so we want to make it super easy. Head to our Instagram, at Living Room Woodstock, and you can sign up in the link in our bio. So just put in your address, we're going to send it right to you. You're not going to want to miss all the goodies inside, so sign up for that. Um, next, you might notice like I'm on the lawn. I look, it's kind of weird. I don't know. You're like, where are you guys? Um, next week is our last outdoor event of the semester. So you're going to want to get your small group, get your friends, get to Woodstock City Church next Wednesday. Uh, we can't wait. Tonight's going to be awesome. Thanks for joining us. So I hope you're comfortable. I hope you're with your friends and let's get tonight started.
Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. After. I love you, Lord, for your mercy. He never failed me And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire And in darkest night You were close like no other I've known you as a father And I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness Oh God, all my life, and all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so good, with every breath that I am able, oh I will see of the goodness. It's running after, it's running after me With my life laid down, I surrendered now I give you everything Cause your goodness is running after It's running after me Cause your goodness is running after Father, thank you so much <laughs> that no matter how far gone that we feel like we ever are, that you keep chasing after us, that your goodness is so much bigger than everything that the world has to offer, everything that the world throws at us. 
you're good no matter what the circumstances are around us. We're so thankful for that, and we love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for singing with us. That was good. Thank you guys. My heart consistently needs that. And I just really do hope, I hope you're taking advantage of these moments where you can remind yourself of what is true. Avery, thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Um, well, hey, I'm excited. Uh, part three of Living the Dream. I hope you all have enjoyed this series, man. This series has been on our radar. I'm not kidding. Two years now, um, it's been a hot minute and we finally decided to make it happen. And if you're just tuning in, uh, it's gonna be really helpful for me to catch you up because this series uh, is about the life of Joseph as found in the first book in your Old Testament, which is Genesis. And if you've never heard the story of Joseph, it's a pretty crazy one. And if you haven't seen parts one and two, I can't encourage you enough to go back and watch parts one and two. But maybe right now, like you're sitting in a watch party for the first time and it's kind of impossible for you to go back and watch parts one and two. I wanna give you just a 45 second recap of how Joseph got to where he's at right now because it'll make a lot more sense uh, if you know a little bit of backstory. And so, and so if you know the story or you've been with us, bear with me for just a minute so I can get everybody on the same page. But Joseph... Uh, he is uh, one of the youngest, he's not the youngest, he's the second youngest in his family. He's got 11 brothers. His father, Jacob, clearly favors Joseph. Like he is the clear favorite in the family. He's Joseph, the coat of many colors. Maybe you remember hearing about him young, when you were younger, but that's who this Joseph is. And his brothers hated Joseph because he was the favorite. But to make matters worse, what we talked about in week one is Joseph has this dream uh, that one day his brothers would bow down to him and Joseph was, gonna, Joseph was gonna rule over them. And it wasn't just any dream, like God gave Joseph this dream. But Joseph, you know, kind of naively and innocently tells his brothers about this dream. There's actually two of them and his brothers hate him all the more. Now the favorite thinks he's gonna rule over them and their hatred gets so bad that they decide they wanna do something about it. They wanna hurt Joseph. So they decide they're going to kill him. That's how bad it got. One of the brothers kind of talks them out of killing him. And instead they throw him into a pit, take his robe and rip it up into a bunch of, you know, mangle it all together. And then they decide to do the next best thing other than killing him. And they say, you know what? Here's an idea. Let's just sell him into slavery instead. So they sold their very own brother for $200 into slavery. And so they take the, this, this robe, this colorful robe back to their father. And they say, listen, a ferocious animal mangled Joseph. We're so sorry. J Jacob is just distraught. He's broken. The brothers are high-fiving. But Joseph, as he's being sold into slavery, now is on his way to Egypt. And a really important detail in the story is that, and we kind of told you the, the end of it in the beginning, is that God wanted to get Joseph to Egypt for a very specific and unique purpose. That Joseph was going to rule in Egypt. And so what we saw at the very, very beginning of the series was God didn't cause the evil of his brothers, but he immediately started redeeming the evil of Joseph's brothers for good because he was taking him to Egypt. So he gets to Egypt and he finds himself at Potiphar's house. Potiphar buys Joseph to be a servant in his household. And Potiphar is a high ranking official, the captain of the guard in Pharaoh's army. So you kind of start piecing this together. You're thinking, oh, here's the connection. He's gonna get go with Potiphar and, and climb the ladder in Egypt. And he starts doing really, really well in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar puts him in charge of everything in his household. But then things take a turn for the worst. Potiphar's wife gets eyes for Joseph and she wants to sleep with Joseph. He says no, she gets embarrassed. And so uh, she makes up a story and she tells Potiphar that Joseph came on to her. And Potiphar is so upset and he's so angry that he throws Joseph in prison. And that is where we find ourselves right now. Are you still with me? Joseph's story is crazy. It's not really an up and down after the other. It's kind of like more medium high and a low after the other. Things start going well in Potiphar's house. And now he finds himself in prison for something that he did not do. And we're going to pick up the story there in Genesis chapter 39, starting in verse 20. And uh, if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. If you do have your Bibles, it'd be great to turn there. Um, but if you don't, we're going to throw it up on the screen as well. Genesis 39, verse 20. But while Joseph was there in prison... The Lord was with him. 
he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So the steam starts emerging in Joseph's life. Like every time something bad happens, somehow Joseph rises up above it. And that somehow is because the Lord never leaves Joseph. The Lord is always with him. And Joseph is just so responsible and so faithful that he keeps on going. And every time he gets a little bit of influence, he starts to crush and he gets more and more responsibility and the Lord blesses his efforts. And so even though he was a servant in Potiphar's house, he finds himself at the top and then he gets into prison, a new low, but now he's in charge of the whole prison. It's an important theme that we're gonna come back to in just a few minutes. And then we learn at the beginning of the very next chapter, chapter 40, that two new prisoners join Joseph the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. The baker obviously is a baker or a chef that used to bake things or cook things for Pharaoh. But the cupbearer, the cupbearer to the Pharaoh or the cupbearer to the king was a really unique role. They were the person that would take a sip of whatever the king was about to drink to make sure that it wasn't poisoned. What a job. And so um, for whatever reason, the chief cupbearer and the baker offend Pharaoh. And so he throws them into prison. And now they're in the same prison as Joseph and they're under Joseph's care because Joseph had been put in charge of everything. Well, I don't know how long, maybe it was their first night in there or whatever, but the chief baker and the chief cupbearer, they both have dreams individually. And they kind of talk about it the next morning and they can't figure out what these dreams mean. And they're a little weirded out by it. And we're going to pick up there in Genesis chapter 40, verse six. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. They were confused, they were discouraged. So he said, he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? What a question. Why do you look so sad? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph says to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. So, so they're like, okay. So the cupbearer tells Joseph his dream and Joseph listens and he goes, okay. And you can look up the details of what the dream actually was. It's, it's not as important. Here's the important part. Joseph says, here's what your dream means, Mr. Cupbearer. In three days, you're going to get out of prison and, and Pharaoh's going to restore you to your original position. So the cupbearer is like loving this interpretation. Like, I don't know if he fully believed him, but he's probably like, I really hope you're right, Joseph. That's incredible. He's loving life right now. And so Joseph, he goes to the cupbearer and, and he says this, he says, but when all goes well with you, in other words, what I told you is going to happen. Like when it all works out the way that I just told you it's going to work out, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. So I don't know exactly what happened. We're not sure, but surely the cupbearer just kind of nodded. He was like, yeah, dude, I got you, man. If this works out, you're my boy. Like we're good. So the baker's kind of off in the corner, kind of watching. He's like, well, cupbearer got a favorable explanation. So let me, let me ask him to interpret my dream. So the baker comes up. He's like, hey, uh, Joseph, sir, can you interpret my dream? And Joseph's like, yeah, so tell me your dream. So he tells him his dream and Joseph goes, well, Mr. Chief Baker, uh, you're also gonna get out of here in three days, but you're not gonna be restored to your normal position. Uh, actually, Pharaoh's still gonna be angry with you and he's going to kill you. And I would not have been wanted to be in that prison cell because that would have been really awkward in that moment. Like, what do you do? Like, you know, like if you're Joseph, it's like, uh, I guess I have, I have to tell you what I know, and, and I can't, I'm laughing, it's sad, but I can't help but wonder what that kind of scenario would have been like, you know, for those three days, you've got Joseph and the cupbearer in one corner, really awkward situation with the baker in the other corner, because his is not going to, like, what do you say to a guy, you know, that like, he's hoping that Joseph is wrong. I can't imagine what that situation would have been like, but three days go by, and we'll pick up there, Genesis 40, verse 20. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday. So they're going to get ready to turn up. And he gave a feast for all his officials. 
He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand and he impaled the chief baker. Just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot about him. So once again, Joseph did good. He did right. And he gets picked over again. The chief cupbearer forgot and not just for like he really forgot about him because what we're going to read in Genesis chapter 41 where we're going to conclude this series next week is that it was another two years that Joseph was in prison it took the chief cupbearer two years to remember Joseph and I know two years might not sound like a really long time but when you don't know that two years is the end two years feels like an eternity And what we find here is that Joseph was in a season of waiting, waiting for God to do something, waiting for God to bring his dream to fruition, waiting for the wrongs that had been done to him to be righted, waiting to figure out what in the world God was up to. And there will be a point whether now, you might find yourself in one now or later for sure, where you will be in a season of waiting. Waiting to figure out what might be next. Waiting for that thing to come to fruition. Waiting for you to get to the place that you want to be, to achieve the dream that you even feel like God has called you to. Kind of stuck in this middle ground between where you were and where you ultimately want to be waiting. And here's an obvious statement. We're not that good at waiting because we live in a culture that does everything possible to make sure we don't wait for anything. And if I'm being honest, there's a lot of it that I love. Like I don't have to wait to watch any show that I want. I could pull it up on Hulu and Netflix. Thank you very much. I don't have to wait for a commercial. I can record it, start at 30 minutes early and fast, start at 30 minutes late and fast forward through the commercials. Thank you, DVR. I don't even have to wait for my Starbucks order anymore because I can mobile order it and pick it up right when I get there. I don't have to wait for my friends to pay me back with cash or however you used to pay people back before Venmo and Cash App. I have no idea how you did that. I can get it instantly. I hardly have to wait for packages that I order because I can pretty much get Amazon Prime one day shipping on just about everything. We're not good at waiting because we don't have to wait for anything anymore. We live in a world of instant gratification. I heard Levi Lusco say, we're the generation that burns our mouth on a hot pocket. Think about that. It cooks for three minutes and we still can't wait for it to cool off. And yeah, it's funny to talk about all the things that that we can't wait for. And we hate slow Wi-Fi. I still hate slow Wi-Fi, okay? But sometimes in life, we're in a season of waiting where there's a lot more at stake than just whether or not my package is going to get there in a day or two. You're in a season of waiting where you're just waiting to graduate and you can't wait for school to be over. You're waiting for your future to begin. You're waiting to um, actually start to make some real money. You're waiting to not work at Chick-fil-A anymore. You're waiting to not be the one to wait tables anymore. You're waiting for your parents to figure it out. You're waiting to not be single anymore. And we're just not great at waiting. In fact, when you find yourself in a season of waiting, when I find myself in a season of waiting, we tend to get frustrated, wondering why, wondering where is God, wondering why this isn't working out the way that we wanted to work out. Maybe we find ourselves anxious, worrying about the future, worrying how things will work out, trying to figure out how we can control things to manipulate it, to work out the way that we want it to. In the seasons of waiting, we even find ourselves getting discouraged, defeated, feeling like nothing will ever be the same, feeling like nothing is ever going to change and kind of coming to the grips that this might be our new normal. So what do we do in a season of waiting? Here's my message. 
What we do in a season of waiting is this. Be faithful where God has you. What do you do in a season of waiting? I want you to be faithful where God has you. And what does that practically look like? Here's what I wanna talk about for the next few minutes together. Practically, what that looks like is this. I want you to worship and work in the waiting. I want you to write that down. I want you to worship and work in the waiting. I want you to worship and work in the waiting. And by worship, I don't mean like singing songs, you know, that, that's just an expression of worship. By worship in the waiting, I mean worship, the truest sense of worship, giving yourself in service to God. I mean, how Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 12, you living, a, being a living sacrifice where you are laying down your life and laying down your own desires to take up what God has for you. Laying down your own hopes and dreams and laying them before God and saying, what would you have for me? That's what I mean by worship. And by working in the waiting, yeah, I mean working with your hands. I mean, taking advantage of the opportunities that God has given you, whether they're the opportunities you want or not. But I also mean work in the sense of working on yourself, trying to grow yourself, trying to better and develop yourself. That we get so focused on trying to figure out what is next that we overlook the now. But what if, what if we started working on ourselves now, asking God to develop ourselves now so we can be ready for what he's got for us next. I want you to work in worship in the waiting. And it's exactly what Joseph did. He worshiped and he worked in the waiting. You know what Joseph did not do? He did not grow bitter because the outcome in his circumstances were not going the way that he thought they would go. He never got bitter with God. He just kept leaning in to his faith. He never got angry with God or, or, or so bitter that he lost faith. No, 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 he kept the faith. He never lost faith. He kept believing that God was with him. In fact, every time he prospered, it was evidence that God was with him. And every time he prospered, even though things kind of went south every now and then, as we're seeing, it seems like every time we're meeting and talking about life with Joseph, we're talking about something bad that happens. But Joseph knew, okay, I don't, I can't, it, he probably was a little frustrated trying to figure it out, but he knew God was up to something. And he never lost faith that God was with him. He never once doubted where he was going to put his faith and where his allegiance lied. And he kept worshiping in the waiting. In fact, you go back to Potiphar's house. And if you didn't catch last week, like I said, you can go back and catch it. But when Potiphar's wife tried to tempt him to sleep with her, his first response was, no, no, no. Why would I sin against God? Like, why would I do something against God? No, 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 no. I'm putting his desires before mine. And I might not fully understand what's going on here, but I'm not gonna compromise what I know is right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep living the way he would have me live. Even though he could have justified his sin, even though he could have looked at God and said, well, you put me here, so I'm gonna have some fun while I am here. He said, no, 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 no. Okay, I don't know why I am here, but I'm not gonna stop believing that God is with me. Come on, look at the prison. Have you ever heard of a prisoner getting so much responsibility that he gets put in charge of the entire prison? No. And, 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 and you remember what happened? We just read it. The cupbearer and the chief baker are worried about these dreams. What did Joseph say? Well, isn't God the one who, who has all, don't interpretations come from God? What was he trying to say? Hey, I can't help you, but I know who can. Hey, I'm not able, but I know who is. Now watch this. Even in the midst of being in prison for something he did not do, he did not doubt that God was not able. He did not get mad that God didn't get him out of the prison. No, no, he kept the faith, believing that God is able to do whatever it is that he ultimately wants to do. He kept the faith. Now he worshiped and he worked his butt off. He was the best attendant that Potiphar ever had. The Lord was with him and the Lord blessed everything that he did. But Joseph, he was responsible. He showed leadership. He was really good at what he did. He was the most responsible prisoner that that prison warden had ever seen. Potiphar didn't concern with anything other than what he ate. 
is what Genesis tells us. And the prison warden, he didn't concern himself with anything in the prison. That man was just chilling in his office with his legs up on his desk, binging Netflix while Joseph took care of everything in the prison. He worked hard. He was responsible. And do you remember this little detail? I read it, but you might've skipped over or kind of, we just kind of passed over it. I did it on purpose. But when the cupbearer and the baker are like feeling sad, Joseph comes up to him. He's like, hey, why are you sad today? Y'all, can I be real with you for a second? If I'm in prison for something I didn't do and I see somebody else sad, you know what I'm not going to do is ask them why they're sad or care about why they're sad because I'll probably think I should be the one sad because you probably did something to deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be here. But what Joseph did was he cared for people. He cared for people regardless of his circumstance. How many of us treat people poorly because things in our life are going bad? No, 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 no. He worshiped and he worked. And when you find yourself in a season of waiting, that's what I want you to do. I want you to worship and I want you to work in the waiting. I want you to lay your your life down and ask God, how can I serve? How can I do your work? How can I do your will? And what can I do? How can I take advantage of this opportunity? How can I get my hands dirty? And how can I better myself through it? I want you to worship and work in the waiting. And let's just get real for a second. Ready? I know you don't want to be single anymore. I get it. And I don't mean this insensitively. Do you know that singleness is a gift? Some of y'all are probably like, Miz, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm turning this off. I'm done with this dude. No, no, just listen to me. Did you know that singleness is a gift? That you will never have more freedom than you do right now. And I'm not promising that all of you are going to get married. Statistics tell us that most of you will. But did you know that you have max, the maximum amount of freedom right now as a single person, if you're single? Like you have the maximum amount of freedom to invest fully and devote yourself to a relationship with your heavenly father that you've got the maximum amount of freedom to travel and to try new things. You've got maximum amount of freedom to learn about yourself and to invest in yourself and to try new things that you've always wanted to try. You've got no one to answer to. That's a gift. Like I love my life and I got to be single. I love my wife and I love my two girls and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I love the season that I'm in, but you know what I can't do? is pick up and go on a weekend with my buddies just because I feel like it. Like I can't pick up at the drop of a hat and hit Southwest for a $55 low fare special Wednesday to fly to Alaska just because I feel like it. Y'all, I've got to plan a four hour round of golf with my friends. Not because my wife is unreasonable because that's a long time to be away if I'm not at work from my family. That my priority now is not me. My priority is Julie Harper. And Samantha, no, no, I'm like so low on the totem pole. Like it doesn't even matter if I get nothing done for me that day. When you're single, you don't, you don't have that. And what you're gonna do is miss what God has for you in your season of singleness because you are so concerned about not being single. I'm telling you. And do you know what else? If you're a single person, what an opportunity to ask God how you can serve him that you'll be able to serve the church. You'll be able to serve God in a way that you can't when you're married. Again, not because married people don't serve. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm saying they're different. And I don't want you to forsake the difference and miss out on what God has for you right now. What if you started asking God, hey, what do you need to root out in my heart and in my life so that I can be the healthiest version of myself whenever I do start dating, whenever I do get engaged or whenever I do get married? This is a gift and I don't want you to miss it. So in this season, man, I want you to worship and I want you to work. Now, I know you don't want to wait on tables anymore. I get it. I know you don't want to work the Chick-fil-A drive-thru anymore. I get it. I did that, by the way. I did. Story for another day. When I was a junior in high school, loved Chick-fil-A, hated that job. I get it. But do you really think that you're going to be entrusted with a lot one day if you're not faithful with a little right now. And I know I'm stepping on some toes, but that's okay. Come on. Some of you have these great aspirations for your career one day 
but your work ethic is awful. You have no initiative at work. Do you really think that when you get the right job, you're just going to turn the switch and you're going to all of a sudden be the best worker and have all the initiative? No, no, no. The initiative and the work ethic. No, that gets cultivated now. Like you doing everything you can and doing the best in whatever job you've got, that starts now. You don't just flip a switch whenever you get your dream job. And let me just be real. You're probably not going to get your dream job out of college. Nobody gets their dream job out of college. That's not real life. I want you to be faithful with where you are. Did you know this? Hear me, hear me, write this down. Christians should be the best employees on the planet. I don't care what job you have. You should be, you might be like, no, you don't understand, Sam. You don't understand. Doing the, the drive through McDonald's, man, that is a prison. Okay, you should be the best person at that drive through Christians should be the hardest working employees on the planet. They should be the most loving coworkers. They should be the most faithful employees on the, like, like employers, I'm telling y'all, they should be lining up to hire Christians. And whatever job you have right now, I'm telling you, I want you to be worshiping and working in the waiting. You should be asking the question, how can I help? You should be running around every day at work. Hey, how can I serve you? How can I be better? How can I do better? Did you know this? God is going to build your character as you crush that drive through tomorrow. God is going to develop your patience as you responsibly deal with that person that is being unreasonable to you as you're waiting their table. And the only reason they're being upset with you is because they had a bad day. So they're just taking it on you. You're going to grow your patience when you learn to love that person. He's going to develop your integrity when you become a shift manager. And now you're in charge of two people. I'm telling you, God's going to grow things in you and he's going to develop your character to set you up for whatever he's got for you next. So I know you don't want to wait on tables anymore. And I know you're tired of wearing the drive through headset, but don't overlook this season and don't overlook what God wants to do in you right now. I want you to worship and work in the waiting. And I know you're tired of going to class. I get it. I'm about to step on some toes, by the way. I wish, I wish some people were here right now so I could kind of see the reaction that I might get. If I hear one more student say, you know, it's tired of school, it's not for me. Really? It's not for me either. Like who likes sitting in a, in a classroom, learning about things that they're probably not gonna need to know for very long and then getting tested about it and then feeling bad about themselves when they don't do well? <laughs> who is that for? I, not for me, not for anybody. You know what I'm saying? You might be taking a year off from school or you might not be in school right now and that's okay. My point is if you are in school, you know what we're so good at doing? Complaining about it rather than being grateful for it. You know what God wants to teach you while you are in school right now? Is to work hard. He wants to teach you a work ethic to do things that no one's going to notice, to do things that nobody is going to see and to do things that you, even you don't want to do. Because newsflash, life is full of doing things that you don't want to do. I just did it when I unloaded my dishwasher this morning. That God's going to teach you and cultivate in you to take nothing for granted. Like you getting to go to school, if you're in school right now, it's a privilege. And did you know, did you know that you can glorify God with your schoolwork? That when you choose to try to do it well, I don't mean get straight A's, but when you give it everything you've got, you can glorify God with your schoolwork. And did you know that if your parents are helping you with school, you can honor your parents by honoring their investment in you by doing well in school and not taking it for granted? And I mentioned this earlier, but we tend to complain more about being in school than being grateful for the fact that we get to be in school. I'm telling you, man, God wants to change your heart so that you can be grateful for things that you so quickly overlook. I'm telling y'all, this will change things for you when you find yourself in a season of waiting now, but also later, because there are gonna be seasons of waiting after college too. And I want you to worship and work in the waiting. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to overlook it because God's got something for you right now. I want you to worship and work in the waiting. Why? Write this down. Because in the waiting, God is working. In the waiting, God is working. 
in the waiting, God isn't absent. God isn't taking a break. God isn't just waiting, uh, you know, for a certain time to bless you with something. No, no, he is working. The problem is we tend to prefer a microwave over a crock pot. Like we want a crock pot relationship using a microwave. We want a crock pot job using a microwave. We want crock pot character using a microwave. But you know this, good things don't come from taking shortcuts. God doesn't like to use a microwave because he knows crock pots are better. Crock pots taste better. Crock pots are more nutritious. You can make way more awesome things in a crock pot than in a microwave. It just takes a little bit longer. But don't you forget for one second that in the waiting, God is working. He's working in you and he can work through you wherever you are. If Joseph can do it in a prison, you can do it single. If Joseph can do it as a servant, you can do it at Chick-fil-A. And I don't know why I keep talking about Chick-fil-A, but it just feels like the only restaurant I can bring up in a sermon, okay? But you know what I mean. And I get it. Seasons of waiting are hard. Even Joseph won it out. Did you catch that? He told the cupbearer, hey, will you please, will you please, Look, when this works out, will you please tell Pharaoh so I can get out of here? Like even Joseph wanted out of the prison. He did not let affect his faith. He did not let it affect his faith in God, but he wanted out. But here's the reality that we catch in Joseph's story. And I don't know if Joseph fully understood this. I think he did eventually whenever he got to the end, which we'll get to next week. But the road to the palace was through the pit in the prison. You got to hear this, write that down. The road to the palace was through the pit and the prison. For Joseph, he would not have been able to be the leader that God needed him to be in the palace had he not gone through the pit in the prison. He learned faith. He learned integrity. He learned perseverance. He learned things about himself that he would not learn, had learned had he gone straight to the palace. No, no, no. God might not have caused the pit in the prison, but he sure redeemed it and used it. And I'm telling you, the road to whatever your palace is, is going to go through the pit in the prison. And living the dream isn't about getting to the palace. Living the dream is the whole journey. Living the dream is how the pit in the prison prepared you for the palace. Because you don't have the dream of the palace without going through the pit in the prison first. So whether that is singleness or you waiting on something, frustrated with where you are, frustrated with a job, frustrated you aren't doing more, just know, I'm not saying there's a palace at the end, but what I do know is God is going to do something. And you're not going to get to the palace without going through the pit or the prison first. That's why, write this down, a wait time doesn't have to be a waste of time. A wait time doesn't have to be a waste of time. No, 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 there's something in it for you right now. And the only way you're gonna miss it, the only way a wait time will turn into a waste of time is if you are so focused on what you hope is next that you are completely overlooking what God has for you right now. A wait time is never a waste of time if you are paying attention to what God has for you right now. If you just choose to work and worship in the waiting. And this message is so personal for me because I remember a very specific season of waiting that I had to kind of work through in my own heart. I knew since I was in college, probably even my senior in high school that I wanted to go into ministry. And I knew, man, I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to speak. Like I wanted to hold the microphone. I wanted to lead a church one day. And I got to college and God just kind of confirmed that in my life. And I got involved in a church. And then I went out to seminary in Dallas, Texas. And to make money for school, and, and I, you, you, a lot of you know this because um, it's just a huge part of my story. I talk about it a lot. Um, I taught swimming lessons at Dolphin Swim School. That's how I made money for school. And I'll never forget this. My second year in seminary, my home church and college invited me back to come speak at their middle and high school retreat. And I was so pumped. I got to come back. I flew in. They flew me back to Atlanta and it was up in Jasper at uh, Sharp Top Cove, which is an incredible camp. And I got to hang out with some of my old friends and see the students that I used to lead when I was an intern there. And I was like the main speaker. Like they all, you know, a few hundred people came to be a part of this weekend and they were there. They, they were there and they were going to listen to me. Like I was going to hold the microphone. I was the one on stage. And if I'm just being totally honest, for, the, for that weekend, I was, I don't know, 23 years old, 22. I was the man. And I was like, they're here to listen to me. They're tweeting stuff about me. And I remember getting home or getting back to Dallas Sunday night. And I, I, 
Monday morning at 8.30, I pull up to Dolphin Swim School and I'll never forget this moment. I'm off this high of a weekend where I'm doing what I really feel like God has created me to do. And then I'm staring at this Dolphin Swim School sign thinking, are you kidding me? Like I, I was doing it and now, and now I'm, I'm staring at the sign. I'm thinking now I'm gonna go back in. There's no stage, there's no microphone. No one's gonna be here to tell me how good of a job I did. I'm gonna teach little kids how to swim. The only ones watching are gonna be the moms and the dads. And I'm probably gonna get staph infection because the pool is a cesspool full of germs. And I, I don't have many of these moments because I don't like to say it flippantly, but this was one of those moments where I vividly heard and felt God speak to me in that moment. He said, Samer, I've got you here on purpose and I've got you here at this swim school for a purpose. And I remember in that moment, him telling me, so listen, stop thinking about what's next. I will take care of what is next. But there's some things that I've got to work out in your heart before you can ever hold a microphone. I've got some things in your heart that I've got to root out before I ever get you on stage. So I don't want you worrying about what's next. What I want you to do is I want you to walk into that swim school and I want you in the name of Jesus to be the best swim teacher that that school and those kids have ever seen. Not so that you can be great. No, no, no. I want you to work and I want you to worship while you wait. I have this vivid memory of that. And from that day, I'm telling you, I just made a commitment to say, you know what? I'm gonna be the best swim teacher of those kids. I, I, told, I used to tell myself going into work every day, I'm gonna make this 30 minutes I have with these kids the most encouraging 30 minutes of their week. I used to pray going into work. I learned so much about prayer. You would think, oh, he's in seminary. He's already good at praying. I learned so much about prayer. I'd pray into going into work every single day for specific things, for specific names, for specific students. And y'all, it was a swim school. And I'll never forget, there were countless stories that I could share, but there was one in specific, one specifically. It was my last day. I was about to move back to Atlanta at Dolphin Swim. I've been there for four years, three and a half years. And there was this little girl McKinley that, that I used to teach swimming lessons to. And she was, I had her when she was two, all the way up to she was almost five. And uh, about halfway through my time with her, her mom got breast cancer, had to have a double mastectomy. It was a very traumatic time in their family. And I'll never forget my last day at Dolphin Swim School. I'm saying goodbye to McKinley. I'm emotional. She's emotional. Jason, the dad is there. He's an emotional. And I'll never forget, I gave McKinley a big hug. I gave her this little note to say goodbye. And then Jason looked at me and said, Samer, can I just tell you something? He said, you know, since we're, we're parting, I just want you to know that the only reason we kept bringing McKinley to swim lessons during the craziness of everything going on with her mom it was because you were the brightest moment of her week and we could not take that away from her. And I just remember going home thinking back to that moment when God said, there's some things I need to teach you. There's some things I need to root out in you. And I just remember thinking, this is what he wanted to teach me. That influence isn't about a microphone. Influence isn't about followers. Influence isn't about a stage. Influence is about people that God wanted to teach me humility. God wanted to teach me that it was never about me and never will be about me. God wanted to prepare things in here to get me to a place where I could lead from here. But there's no way that I would have ever been the leader that I am today with so much more to grow had it not been for my time in the pit, the swimming pool at Dolphin Swim School. In the waiting, God is always working. And a wait time doesn't have to be a waste of time. So what I want you to do and what I hope you take to heart is I want you to worship and I want you to work in the waiting. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together today. And I pray, Lord, that you would instill in us a heart of discipline to worship and work while we wait. To not take for granted where you have us, to not overlook opportunities that you've put before us, but to work and worship while we wait, believing in you and trusting in your timing and trusting you to do whatever it is that you will in our lives and for our future. 
It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Hey, we love you guys and we will see you live, like really live for part four of Living the Dream next week.